morning, thank you. It's uh, great to be here. It's weird to see this image as often as I've been seeing it over the last <laughs> two weeks. Um, yeah, as uh, Josh mentioned, I am uh, with UA Presents and the University of Arizona, and I am very honored and pleased to be with you today. Before we get started, I do want to thank uh, the people of Centennial Hall who made this happen. Last night there was a performance in here. The night before there was a performance in here. Tomorrow there's something else happening in here, and the fact that they were able to make time and space for this here today, I appreciate it. Um, so thank you guys over there. So I've been living in Tucson now for six months. Um, six months has um, felt absolutely amazing. The fact that you can fall in love with a place so hard and so fast in such a short period of time has blown my mind, um, especially as someone who grew up in Arizona. Um, I grew up in Arizona in the North Phoenix area, um, and then I went away. Um, but it's not my first time in Tucson. In fact, my first time in Tucson <laughs> was here at Old Tucson. Um, I think I was about three. I'm not sure why there was a clown at Old Tucson. I know today I'd be very upset that it wasn't like Black Bart or um, the Lone Ranger. Um, but, but needless to say, this was my, my first memory of being here in Tucson. It also makes me think that we should all be at the rodeo instead of on this stage. Um, my first time on this stage, though, was right here. This is the Desert Sky Middle School Jazz Band. We performed on the Centennial Hall stage in the early 90s. Um, for those of you wanting to know, this is me. Um, I think that the reason why I was in the center was not because I was um, the number one drummer or percussionist, but because I was the shortest and that's how the photo worked out. Um, because I've never really been a performer and definitely wasn't much of a drummer. Um, I was a nationally um, ranked mascot. I, I won the national championships as a mascot in, um, in high school. Um, and then I left Arizona for 25 years. I say all this because I got into the arts and um, was not ever expecting um, to, to be in this business. I'm not a performer. Um, I'm, I'm not somebody who enjoys to be even standing here or on a stage like this. Um, but I like bringing people together. Um, and for the last 20 years, that's what I've been doing. Um, first in Pennsylvania um, by connecting live performance to communities. Uh, this is an Indonesian puppet company, Paper Moon Puppet Theater. And then um, a, a company called So Percussion with Emily Johnson and Gray Murray and an Amish blacksmith and, and others on stage um, before moving then to New Haven, Connecticut. Um, this is Magmanis uh, Contemporary Circus Company from Sweden. Um, Australians, The Strong Lady, um, with International Festival um, Fellows. This is um, the festival that I was the artistic director of, has an amazing fellowship program. And you're asking yourself, why are we talking about all of these people with the investment in the arts? Um, but the fact that you can bring 20,000 people together and go from this to, that's actually the same time, um, that's the 20,000 people in my glasses, um, to make yourself a career as a cultural curator, working with artists and audiences, investing in the power of the arts to build stronger communities. And that's, that's what got me to Tucson. Now, as we look at Tucson, if it weren't for the University of Arizona deciding to reinvest in the arts, and some would, would say even taking a risky investment in the arts by bringing me here, I wouldn't be here today. I'm very excited to be working here at a university that has a strategic plan that includes arts and culture throughout the entire document. Um, a year ago, when, when I was considering coming here, it never would have occurred to me to, uh, to move to Tucson without this plan in, in place and without the leadership of Doc Robbins and Andy Scholes, our Vice President of the Arts. The good news about a risky investment in arts and culture is it can mean a great payout for the community. We take the risk, you get the reward. But how are we going to do this? Well, the first thing we're going to do is, you saw that UA Presents logo. Um, 
you can start to forget that logo, actually. It's been around for 25 years. It's done amazing work. But we're going to be changing things up. You're sitting on this stage. I want you to get very comfortable on this stage. But I also want you to know that um, as we change the work that we're doing, um, we're going to, to be changing where we, we do our work. Because in the past, people invested in the arts by building, building cathedrals for the arts, kind of like this or like this, and yes, even like this. But moving forward, by investing in the arts, we're going to be taking our arts to our communities and our people, rather than expecting people to meet us in our temples and engaging in our rituals. And Centennial Hall will be our stage, but we'll be shifting to make Tucson and Southern Arizona our stage. Um, Perhaps in a few months we can do this again, though, and talk about how the university is going to be investing in this space and making it a lot better, um, both for you as audience members and for our, our performers here, too. How we focus on the work we bring to Tucson is also changing. We're going to be targeting students in the university community and the million of us that live here year round by bringing live performance from around the world. But we'll also be looking at the artists here in Tucson and taking them to the world highlighting their work and focusing on them. Here at the university, we won't just educate our doctors, our lawyers, our business people, but also ne our next generation of culture goers by giving live experiences to the arts. Our future leadership depends more and more on emotional intelligence and the ability to listen deeply, have empathy, and articulate change. We will be investing in the future of new work by commissioning and projects giving it a chance to be produced, to experienced, and more importantly, to, be, to live and, and to be seen. For those of you who um, had a chance to see Camille A. Brown and dancers here last year, this is a piece that we started investing in, um, we being me, um, about 10 years ago. Um, and the fact that it is now touring all around the world is something that, that I'm, I'm quite proud of. Performances will be less about the 8 p.m. start time and more about the experiences surrounding us, experiences we can and will have together. So how do we do this? We have and do a performance like Dracula. <laughs> Your faces, it's really great. You're like, what the, f Dracula? No, <laughs> because we put a blood bloodmobile out in front of the building. And um, we, we create opportunities for us to gather and, and share our blood with others, um, but really get in and get into the experiences of, of seeing these performances as one. And we can't talk about investing in the arts without talking about the financial side of it. And this is where I can see some of you really getting excited and some of you looking very bored. But um, why even try to make a risky investment? We're inundated by panic stories about the death of art and dwindling audiences. But arts today are more important than ever and critical to the health and economic growth of our city, Tucson. For every dollar spent attending a performance uh, generates five to seven dollars to our local economy. Restaurants, parking, hotels, piano tuners. And here, as uh, Americans participating in the arts, and you can see all of the, this data on the NEA's website, they just released the study in December, but in Arizona alone, we know that 48% of us attend arts events. 51% of us read literature. Over 34% of us perform or create. And 78% of us have consumed arts and culture by electronic media. We attend events because we want to social socialize, but we have no time. We go because we want to experience, but then there's the costs. We go because we want to learn, but we have no one to go with. How do we flip this? And let's not forget it's not just about the numbers. Every dollar signifies an interaction, not just a transaction. From bartenders to Uber drivers to ticket takers, it takes a lot more than the artists that put on the performance. Investing in the arts makes us proud of where we live and makes us better and more whole people. It makes us better neighbors, friends, activists, bankers, doctors, and creatives. And the bonus is when you invest in an event, who are you going to see? Who will you be with? This is a photo of a performance called Home by Jeff Sobel um, that starts and takes place on a stage like this 
And when it gets started, there's nothing on the stage. And by the end of the performance, you have this two-story house that is built. But it's not about the house. It's about the people that come together and create the home. The arts invite us to look at our fellow humans with generosity and curiosity. If we have ever needed that capacity in history, we need it now. We need it today. Investing in the arts empowers people, as shown here in the theatrical piece called Haircuts by Canadian theater company Mammalian Diving Reflex. And I'm going to just play this little video. Hello, my name is Aisha, and today I'll be your head stylist. Please take a seat. The show is called Haircuts by Children and it's just Haircuts by Children. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't realise they'd run everything. This season, the London style is... They're right down there. Not colouring your hair. Absolutely violated, <laughs> but uh, you know, what can you do? Anything for lift. I wasn't going to have it coloured, and then they really wanted to, to, to colour it. I think they, they thought it was going to match my t shirt. It's about trusting kids, is sort of one way we talk about it, and it's also a moment where kids and adults have a kind of intimate moment together, kids and adults who don't know each other, and we're kind of looking at stranger danger and, and, the, and the communication between, like intergenerational communication between people who are generally not allowed to spend any social time together, and we create a kind of safe social space for them to hang out. I thought that was excellent. I thought the atmosphere was brilliant. So yeah, great. I mean, I'd say to everyone, get your head cut by 10-year-old children. Why not? Investing in the arts gives democracy and empowerment. If you really want to give political power to young people, give 10-year-olds a pair of scissors and go sit in the chair. The last piece that I want to share with you as, as I close is a piece by Craig Walsh, an Australian photographer. Um, Craig comes into communities and identifies three people with that community that deserve their own monument. These are people that have flown under the radar, people that we should know about, people that have changed our place, um, but people we should be celebrating. And as I play this video, I'd like to share um, about an experience I had a couple weeks ago that has after Josh asked me to, to give this um, little talk, has just resonated over and over about the importance of investing and investing in ourselves and, and of course, the power of the arts. So a couple weeks ago, I was invited to join a think tank focused on entrepreneurism. We were brought together to listen and interact with high-level thinkers from all walks of life. Surprisingly, this was not a time designed to talk about startups or financing. It was and is a time we listened to world thinkers talk about the human brain, global warming, democracy, international warfare and terrorism, AIDS re research, race and equi equality, and the arts. This was a somewhat different meeting for me. Often when I meet with arts people around the country, our discussion is dominated increasingly by the prospects for survival. How will we compete in a market-driven world? How will we keep ourselves on the funding agenda? What will it take to raise an endowment? The issue of survivability was never raised. The assumption is that many will not, and perhaps should not, survive. Instead, 
The issues were not how will we survive financially, but how will we change the world? How will we solve global warming? How will we solve AIDS? How will we leave the world a healthier, ecologically balanced, less poverty-ridden place? How will we remove the hate and create an equally just place? Indeed, the unspoken agenda was that there is nothing that we cannot do. And as hard as it may seem, even in 2020, truly anything is possible. One may call this crazy, but what became clear to me is that within this world of infinite possibilities, there are new possibilities for us to invest in the arts. I was encouraged that this group wanted to be in a room together. This community insists on coming together because of the unique value of live, face-to-face, -face, collective experience, to conspiring meaning, meaning to breathe together, to breathing the same air. And throughout the day, a minor accord, a palpable hunger, throbbed in the background. This group was desperate to slow down, to lead less frenetic lives, to find the courage to live for their passions. More and more, they placed a premium on contemplation, on captivation, on focus and extended surrender to the single experience. Experience that would captivate, resonate emotionally, at its best enhance spiritual value to the very things that we in the arts do. You'll be hard pressed to find someone that believes more in the power of investing in the arts than I do. And I'm honored to be part of this community and our city and look forward to our work together. And um, at this time, I think we're going to take some questions. But before we do that, I want you to know that we at Arizona Arts and UA Presents are hiring. And if uh, you are interested, please check us out online. And if you know any amazing marketers out there, um, we want you. Thank you. <laughs>